Welcome to your daily dopamine with Dr. Joe McCullough, where we deliver daily doses of education, entertainment, and inspiration. So sit back, I had this made on five five bucks. All right, welcome to Ask a Physicist Anything with Paul Graham. My name is Joe McCullough. I am the physics program chair at Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz, California. And today, Paul is going to talk all about gravity waves. So if you don't know anything about it, hot, new, exciting discovery is supposed to be announced tomorrow, and it's big. So Paul is going to fill us in, tell us what a gravity wave is, what they might have found, and uh, yeah, I hope it's going to be... So let me move, set this up. Go to it, Paul. All right, well, good to see everybody again. We've missed you during the hiatus here. Um, the, so yeah, Joe came into my classroom this morning and said, uh, Paul, can we talk about LIGO today at the, uh, at, at the Ask a Physicist Anything? And I said, well, yeah, LIGO's kind of cool. What LIGO is, is an experiment done by Caltech which the whole point of the experiment is to build the most sensitive detector they can for a gravity wave. So we'll tell you a moment what we mean by a gravity wave. We've talked before in here sometimes, for those of you who have been kind of watching our, our broadcast in the past, we've talked before about Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is kind of saying you've got the space-time, the arena in which physics takes place, is not just a passive arena where things can happen, but it turns out that space-time itself is an active player in physics. You can take the fabric of space-time, and I'm sitting here kind of minding out like a two-dimensional sheet with my hands. Well, I'll say right away, space-time is not a two-dimensional sheet. Even when it is flat and it's quiescent and it's not doing anything all that interesting, it is a four-dimensional structure. You've got your three spatial axes, you've got your time axes. So right away, I've switched it down to two dimensions, but I've said, hey, the way general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, explains, uh, explains the way the gravitational force works is that it is not a force at all. The two rules that go into gravity are energy bends the fabric of space-time, so energy tells space-time how to bend, and then space-time tells matter how to move. Because the, the first step of that, we sometimes say mass distorts space-time. Which is true, because hell, if I was going to talk about Einstein and I was going to draw a little cartoon of Einstein standing at a blackboard, how do you know I'm drawing Einstein? Well, there's two ways you know I'm drawing Einstein. I do the Einstein here. Okay, right away, there's, there's a, and then I put a blackboard here, and what does he write on the blackboard? M e equals mc squared. Now that is actually from special relativity. That's true, you know, regardless of whether you, uh, uh, of you know, whether it turns out to be accurate that mass distorts space-time in the way that, uh, that that we predict in GR. But this is saying, yeah, um, objects have energy tied up in them just by existing. When we talked before about particle accelerators, the Higgs boson, matter and antimatter, how do you create matter and antimatter? Well, you slam two existing particles together and you give them enough excess energy that the energy that they bring to this collision is able to create new matter and antimatter, new mass, out of the vacuum. As Feynman used to like to say, if it's not forbidden, it's mandatory. Meaning if the laws of physics allow something to happen, then there is at least a probability that it will happen in that collision. Um, so when we say, you know, if you say I thought mass distorted space-time is what I've always heard, why do you say energy? Well, mass is just one very concentrated form of energy. In today's universe, most of the available energy is tied up in the form of mass. So in today's universe, the main thing that's determining the gravitational landscape, so the main thing that's determining the curvature of space-time, is mass. In the very early universe, actually there was a lot more energy tied up in light waves and other forms of radiation. They call that a radiation-dominated universe, and the main thing determining the shape of space-time back then was all of that energy. So one way or another, I've got this fabric of space-time. If I have got energy concentrated in each region, the space-time around it is drawn into a curved shape. 
you will sometimes see those um, animations of funnels. If you're looking at a YouTube video on a black hole, they will show you a what looks like a big piece of graph paper, usually with glowing blue lines on it. And as you approach the black hole, the glowing blue lines are drawn into this curved funnel shape. Well, except that we're trying to compress four dimensions down into two, that's not actually a bad way to draw this. But in the region around that big concentration of energy, which is the black hole, then yeah, the space-time is drawn into that curved shape. Now, if you then do a close flyby of that black hole, so if I've got this funnel shape here, and I try to fly a little space probe by it, which of course we've never managed to do. We've had space probes do very interesting flybys recently of things like Pluto. We have not yet built a space probe to go do a flyby of a black hole. It would be awesome when we do. Um, but if, if I do, then I'd say, yeah, as I enter that curved space-time region, well, the space probe's just doing its best to move in a straight line. That's what Newton's first law tells it to do, but it's trying to move in a straight line through a curved region of space. There is no perfectly straight line. It does its best. It follows what they call a geodesic. Geodesic is a mathematician's word for the straightest possible line through a curve, the straightest possible path through a curved space. So that's what that probe would follow if it was kind of edging around the uh, region around a black hole. That's what that probe follows when it's edging around the region around some more mundane thing like a, a, our sun or the earth or Pluto or Jupiter or anything else. The reason why this pen follows a curved path through this room is actually the geodesic equation. According to general relativity, what's going on here is that pen was doing its best to move in a straight line. And you can say, well, wait a minute. A straight line would just be kind of like this. And it's, ah, but I'm, I'm forgetting two things. First off, I was trying to move in a straight line, not just from one point in space to another, but from one point in space time. So I'm looking for the straightest possible line from this point in space at this moment in time to the landing point which was over here at this point in space at this later moment in time when the thing landed. And I'm having to take into account that the space time in that region in between is curved by the presence of the planet under our foot. This planet has a fair amount of mass. That mass times c squared gives me a pretty damn big amount of energy. That much energy is able to pull the space time into a curved configuration. I sometimes think of it almost like if you look at a flat two-dimensional map and you say, hey, I want to fly from San Francisco to um, London. Well, I mean, I look at the map and I say, well, I know how to fly from San Francisco to London. I go straight across like that. Possible topic for a future show, wormholes. Uh, well, oh, okay. We could probably yes. touch on that, but. But, but yeah, I, 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 then I look at the airline map and the airline says, yeah, this is the path we're gonna take from San Francisco to London. And I look at it and I say, you are deliberately going out of your way to waste my time and burn extra fuel and make me sit on that airplane longer and I demand my role. Well, no, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be going off on a tangent there because this is actually the shortest path from San Francisco to London. I might be looking at a two dimensional map, but since this is taking place on the surface of a, um, of a spherical globe, then yeah, a path along a great circle is actually a shorter distance. That is the geodesic from San Francisco to London. In the same way, this was the geodesic from the starting point in space-time for that Penn's flight to the ending point in space-time. So this is what we mean when we say that Mass and energy curve space-time. So a quick little pause for people Go. just joining. We are doing Ask a Physicist Anything. This is episode 11, and we are talking about a new discovery about to be announced tomorrow from LIGO. Ooh. Hopefully, we're going to be seeing gravity waves, and it's going to be a big, big deal. Paul's explaining what are gravity waves. All right, so this was just static curvature of space-time. We've gone into this before when we talked about time dilation. As you approach a black hole, time slows down and all that. That's all stuff that happens because space-time is curved near that high energy concentration that we call a black hole. Now, what are gravity waves? Well, this is saying, what if you make some sudden change to that? So we let energy just hang out in some region. We'll pull the space-time into a curved configuration. But what if that energy is actually moving around quickly? What if I've got this... Um, planet like the Earth, and all of a sudden I decide to split it in half. And then I bring the two halves back together. 
don't be standing on the planet when this happens. Pick, pick, pick one that you're not using for anything else. But um, in this case, those sudden changes I'm making to how the energy is configured and at what point in space it is, this is going to cause ripples in the fabric of space-time. In the same way that if I, there's a you know, classic example you always see, of set a bowling ball on a trampoline and it will pull the trampoline into this curved configuration. Now leaving aside the whole issue that, wait a minute, the bowling ball is being pulled by outside gravity. Is that, well, well oh, okay, fine, we're trying to make an analogy. It's not, not, not always perfect. But if instead of just leaving the bowling ball there and watching this beautiful curved shape for the trampoline, if I spike the bowling ball off the trampoline, then I'm going to get ripples uh, spreading out from that region of impact. That is just what you get in general relativity. You take Einstein's equations of GR and you say, what if I made some sudden change to the energy distribution in some region? Well, the equations tell you, okay, that would create ripples that would spread outward. Now, as it turns out, they are ripples that would spread outward at the speed of light. They are ripples just in the fabric of space-time itself. They carry energy, but they're not really carrying matter with them. They're not, uh, you know, uh, ripples that are that have been, uh, you know, particles are moving closer and farther away, like sound waves. This is just ripples in that background fabric of space-time. Again, space-time is not a passive arena. It is an active player in the game. It can be carrying these waves even if there's really nothing else around that it's interacting with. So to be clear, if I had a meter stick, yes, and then suddenly a gravity wave came by, I would see that meter stick change in length. Uh, or at least you would see the space around it change in length. Whether you saw the meter stick change in length or not, kind of we were, we were you know, John and Carlos and, and, and I were debating that in there earlier and uh, kind of trying to, to say what would, uh, what would happen if you shrunk some region of space-time? Well, that meter stick's got bonds that are telling the molecules how far apart to stand. So if you shrink the region of space-time, but those bonds are still saying, hey, yeah, but I want to be one angstrom apart, then you'd say that meter stick no longer fits in the region of space-time I thought it was going to. It's kind of spilling out on the edges. So it might be that if you shrink the space-time that you're actually seeing the meter stick expand relative to that, that, that space-time. Now, if you, the, the way LIGO works, the thing we use to detect gravity waves. So first off, you notice it takes a tremendous amount of energy to curve space-time noticeably in the first place. It, the space-time in this room is barely curved. This pen, um, you know, if, if this pen were moving any decent fraction of the speed of light, it would move in an almost perfectly straight line. The fact that uh, it curves a little bit means, okay, we got this mild curvature to space-time. Well, it took the mass of an entire planet to just give me this mild curvature. And that mass times c squared, c, the speed of light, is a big number. It's 3 times 10 to the 8th. This is a freaking tremendous amount of energy, and it barely gave me any curvature at all. If I wanted to create gravity waves, now I've got to say, and I also need to change the configuration of this energy on scales kind of you know, close to moving at the speed of light, it's not an easy thing to do. If I clap my hands, I created gravity waves. I mean, I know I created sound waves, but even if I was doing this in a vacuum, I wouldn't create sound waves, I would still create gravity waves. It would be that sudden acceleration of my hands at the end of that motion that would create ripples in the gravitational field. They would be so subtle, you would never notice them. I mean, if I said one trillionth of the width of a proton would be the, uh, the amount that the uh, space-time would ripple back and forth by these things, I would be vastly over-exaggerating it. The space-time would stretch and compress. It would be like I took this thing. If this was a, a piece of mesh, and I pull it this way, so I stretch it out, but then that means it would compress along this axis, and then I let it spring back, so it stretches along this axis, compresses on the other one. The gravity waves I make by doing this, yeah, that happens, but it happens by 10 to the minus probably several hundred, uh, you know, times the, the width of a proton. Well, not, not that extreme, but I didn't manage to make detectable gravity waves. You didn't notice them. If you, you said, well, I, I noticed them. I heard you clap your hand. Yeah, the sound waves were noticeable. The gravity waves were not. If I want detectable gravity waves, well, the best detectors that humans have ever made, the LIGO detector, which I'm going to tell you about, can, can that detect me clapping my hands in the room with the LIGO detector? No. Can it detect, I don't know, two giant trucks on a collision course slamming into each other outside LIGO? 
No, if they could, then we'd just put two giant trucks on a collision course and somebody would pay for the trucks and uh, we'd, we'd have gravity waves. No, you can't detect that. The gravity waves are too subtle. What can it detect? Well, one thing that we were kind of thinking might be the first detection would be if a supernova went off. Now, a supernova is this explosion at the end of the lifetime of a star, which is much more massive than our sun, where the star itself collapses into a neutron star. So all the mass of that star collapses into a ball about the size of the planet Earth. If that happened in a nearby galaxy, sorry, we're too far away, that was a hell of an energetic event, we can't detect the gravity waves. If that happened in our galaxy, I think, I mean, I haven't, I haven't kept up on the latest exactly how good LIGO has gotten. I think it would have to be kind of over in our corner of our galaxy that that supernova would go off before we would be able to detect it at LIGO. How do you make a supernova go off? You can't, you just gotta wait. So we've been kind of building these instruments and hoping that some nearby event would happen that releases enough energy into gravity waves that we would actually be able to detect the signature. So what is the LIGO detector itself? It was put together by Caltech, right down the uh, California coast from where we are right now. It is a giant interferometer. We were arguing among ourselves in the department just about an hour ago, is this just a big Michelson interferometer? And why don't they just call it a big Michelson interferometer? As far as I know, it's a big Michelson interferometer. What, what, does, what does that mean? Well, you've got two arms, four kilometers along. So these labs have these giant hallways extending off four kilometers at the same. Center point, you put a half-silvered mirror. You put a mirror that lets half the light through, bounces half of it off. You shine a laser beam at it. It's a pretty powerful laser beam. It's like four watts, which, uh, you know, like a laser pointer is, uh, what's a, a, a laser pointer? Milliwatts. Milliwatts. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's not an immensely powerful laser beam. You're not gonna be, uh, I don't know, shooting down the moon with it or something like that. But I mean, it's, 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 it's big compared to a laser pointer. Slightly infrared is the one they use, so it's not actually visible light. But you shine the laser at this thing, half the light goes through the mirror, half the light, ah. I better orient the mirror so it actually right. sends the light beam <laughs> down that long hallway, otherwise I built a four kilometer hallway for no reason. Um, let me tilt the mirror that way. There you go. Half the light bounces off that mirror and down that long hallway, which otherwise would have been really lonely. Okay. The light continues down the hallway through this boring, unaltered region of space-time because there's no gravitational waves going by at the moment that we can detect. Bounces off the mirror at the end of the hallway, comes back along another four kilometer path. And finally, because we've lined all this stuff up beautifully, hits that same mirror it started with. Now, if you had me do this, I never would have even reached this point in getting the experiment to work. You're supposed to aim the thing four kilometers that comes back and hits the same goddamn mirror? What do you think I am, a miracle worker? However, the, the, this is what separates theorists from experimenters. Yes, the LIGO experimenters can do this. So that beam comes back, and again, half the light bounces off the mirror, which just means it kind of goes back where it started and gets lost. Half the light goes through the mirror, and here's where you put the detector. Now, meanwhile, on the other half, same story. The light that originally went through the mirror, four kilometers, bounce off that mirror, four kilometers back. Half of it goes through and again, just hits the original laser and is useless to us. Half of it bounces off, comes over. Both of those beams hit that detector. And because light is a wave, you get interference patterns. At some spot, the light will interfere constructively and you'll get a much more intense light. At other spots, it'll interfere destructively. What you do is you set up your main detector at one of the spots where the light was gonna interfere destructively. So you kind of say you've got this pattern of constructive and destructive fringes appearing on this, uh, on this wall over here. So one way I could write it is, Put this wall, and yeah, I light up this area of the wall really strongly, constructive interference. Then I get a dark area. I light up this one really strongly. I light up this one really strongly. Where am I gonna put my detector? At the dark areas. I build the most sensitive detector I possibly can, which again means it's not me who builds it. It's somebody competent who builds it. But somebody competent builds the most powerful detector they possibly can to detect this infrared light and they set it at a spot where you're not expecting any light at all. 
man, it seems like a waste of time to build a beautiful detector and then put it where you get no light at all. Well, at this moment, I'm getting no light at all at that spot. But if a gravitational wave came by, if it stretched this region of space-time just a little bit, so maybe it's oriented so that this distance compresses, so that the distance from here to this mirror is not quite as great as it was. So it's, it's not that it's moving the mirror exactly, it's moving the space-time in between. There's not as much space in between that mirror and that one. How much less? Well, if a supernova went off really close to us, like, you know, only, say, a thousand light years away and our galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across, I think they calculated that the, um, this distance would change by about one one hundredth of the width of a proton. Now, when I said proton, for those who are uh, not up on their particle physics, a proton is freaking tiny. Here's an atom. Here's a cloud of electrons that make up most of the space in the atom. Here's the nucleus, and I've drawn the nucleus way too big. The nucleus should be 100,000 times smaller than the atom. A proton is one of the particles in the nucleus. So take a single atom, go 100,000 times smaller than that, you got a proton. Go like 100 to 1,000 times smaller than that. And I might even be like, a, it might be I owe you a few more zeros on that. It might be that you need to go like 10,000 times smaller than that. Now you have got the amount that this space-time region is going to compress by when, a, when what to us is a very powerful gravity wave, one that came from an astoundingly high-energy event, goes by. That's how much you get this to compress out of a four-kilometer distance. This is why you need such a sensitive detector there, is because, hey, this used to be a point of perfect destructive interference. Now it's not quite quite perfect because you've muffed with the calibration of that space-time. And if you get any light at all at that point, that's a possible detection that something has happened. Now, what has happened? Well, you try to do your best to isolate these things from vibrations and stuff, but maybe a truck went by on the freeway and this mirror just vibrated. It wasn't that the space-time in between changed at all. It was the mirror that moved. Well, that could also trigger this detector to think that you were seeing a little light. So what do they do? They build LIGO detectors all over the world. They have dozens of these labs now, if I remember correctly. So the, um, what you're looking for is an event that happens at all of them. Something that happens at one of them might just be, uh, you know, somebody was careless and didn't damp the vibrations down properly. Something that happens at all of them simultaneously, that's a real detection. Now, you set this up and you wait. Because again, we have no way of creating gravitational waves. We would love it if we could just, you know, cram, slam two big steel balls together with enough, releasing enough energy as gravitational waves that you detect them at one of these things. That would be the easiest thing in the world. You'd say, okay, we can make gravity waves on command. Of course we can detect them. We can do that with radio waves. We can do that with microwaves. That's how we calibrate receivers. With LIGO, we just gotta wait. It would take something like a supernova going off again, kind of in our local region, the Milky Way galaxy, to create strong enough waves to trigger this detector. Now, so that's what I would have told you about LIGO two days ago. Um, Joe comes into class this morning and says, hey, Paul, you want to talk about LIGO today? I said, well, sure, LIGO's fun. He says, because you heard what they discovered, right? And I think I yelled a series of things you're not supposed to yell in front of a, uh, a, a, a classroom full of students. My students are used to it. Um, I, I went to Google, and actually, I'm disappointed with Google. I went to Google and I entered the search terms, LIGO, holy shit. <laughs> Which is actually a, a more sedate version of what I yelled when Joe told me. Um, that, at least the first page did not give me anything. I had to go to the <laughs> LIGO gravitational wave detector. LIGO black hole merger is I think what I typed and, and, and finally started finding the articles I wanted. Well, hell, that gives away what, what apparently has happened is the event that created, that apparently has created what sounds like it's gonna be the first gravitational waves that humanity has ever detected, was not a supernova explosion, which is the one that I would have kind of bet for. Apparently what happened is they saw a signature at not just one LIGO detector, at every LIGO detector in the world, otherwise they wouldn't be announcing this, which is exactly the signature of gravity waves you would expect if two black holes, orbiting one another, 
find that orbit decaying and decaying and they're getting closer and closer to each other and they're orbiting faster and faster and faster and faster and they merge. <laughs> and at that moment when they merge, only for the period of about a second, they would be giving off a tremendous amount of energy as gravitational waves. In fact, what, um, what the rumors are saying is they have seen an event where you had two black holes one was about 20 some times more massive than the sun. One was, I think, about 40 some times more massive than the sun. Hey, Orbiting Lily. One another. <laughs> hey, we got uh, five okay. minutes to wrap it Two up. Two black holes. Orbiting Welcome one back. Another. Yeah. And when they collided, <laughs> suppose it was 40 suns and 26 suns. I don't have the numbers exactly right. But they, as, as they got closer, what you would see is a they would be giving off a pattern of gravitational waves where the, the, the period of the gravity wave would be correspond to how long it takes them to orbit each other. And as their orbits decay and they get closer and closer and spiral in on one another, the waves would get faster and faster. They would get higher and higher amplitude. It's giving off more and more energy at a faster and faster rate and when they collide, this goes off the charts. And you get this brief instantaneous burst of really powerful gravitational waves. And then after the fact, and what I'm telling you now is not yet what they've announced, but I've been kind of haunting the, uh, the, the articles from people who have kind of spent their time modeling out what a black hole merger should look like, what gravitational waves should it produce. And what you'd see is, you know, that slow oscillation at first, getting faster and faster and higher amplitude, a big spike as they merge, and then they call this ringing down to curve. Ringing like a bell ringing, but you would get, and these would actually be so fast, they'd be kind of almost on top of each other. But for a little while, what you get after the collision would be a, a wobbly black hole. Now, there is no such thing as a wobbly black hole. Black holes are supposed to be perfectly spherical. This one's going to be all out of equilibrium for a moment after those things merge. But as it continues to spin at almost the speed of light on the outer edges and wobble, it will quickly radiate away that excess wobbliness, the energy that it's taking it to wobble. It will radiate that away, as you guessed it, more gravitational waves. And as it does that, that is this ringing down that they talk about here. This is the thing rapidly radiating away that excess wobbliness. And they say radiating down to Kerr, or what they mean by Kerr. The Kerr metric, worked out by a physicist named Kerr, was, uh, is the description of a regular old sedate spherically symmetric black hole. So they're saying this weird wobbly merged black hole turns back into a regular spherical black hole. And as it does it, it was radiating away all the excess energy that it had in that wobble. What you would do to try to deduce what must have just happened, you would pay attention to the rate of this ring down. That would give you one constraint on how big the initial and final black holes must have been. Apparently, according to people who study it, the rate at which these things build up and the rate at which the frequency gets faster and faster as they orbit toward each other, that gives you a second clue onto how big the, three, the, the two objects must have been. And your third clue is the total amount of energy released. Because suppose, and again, this is kind of in the ballpark, I think, of what they said. Suppose I started with one black hole that was about 40 solar masses, 40 suns worth of mass, one that was, let's say, 26, and again, this isn't the exact numbers I've heard, but uh, I didn't write down the exact numbers. It's in the ballpark. Well, they say that this final Kerr black hole was about 36, or 63 solar masses. Wait a minute, 63? I thought this 40 plus 26? That's 66. What the hell happened to the other three black hole, or the other three suns worth of mass? It got radiated away as gravitational waves. And because these are just black holes in empty space and there's no other real matter anywhere near them, the only way it can shed that energy is gravitational waves. There's nothing else available. It's not glowing. It's not giving off visible light because it would need charged particles for that. It hasn't got any charged particles. So 
if you just add up the total amount of energy that was given off by this event, so you integrate out the total energy in the signal, that tells you how much mass was lost. And apparently those three clues from what I've been able to tell, I mean, I've been frantically reading papers ever since Joe told me this this morning, saying, okay, they say 40 and 26, how the hell do they know those numbers? Where do they get the clues? Apparently, as I understand it, the three clues are that ring down, the rate at which it loses energy in the ring down, this build up, the rate at which the frequency and the amplitude increase in the build up, and just the total energy in the entire signal, the total energy given off by the thing. Out of those three clues, you can reconstruct these three numbers. What was the mass of object number one? What was the mass of object number two? And what was the mass that was left over after they merged and rang down? Now, this is, again, a lot of what I'm telling you is just based on people who have been working out models of what we should see if black holes uh, collide. We know that LIGO um, has uh, announced they've got something big to tell us tomorrow. We know from various uh, emails which people sent out to uh, possibly overly large mailing lists with uh, woohoo as the subject line and all that, <laughs> that whatever it is is some, some, something big. Uh, some of the professors involved have been kind of, you know, talking to their undergrad students and some of the undergrads can't keep their mouths shut. I mean, it's not this a state secret or anything like that, but they're kind of trying to say, yeah, we'd rather like, uh, kind of still have some excitement left when we make the announcement. So the official big announcement is tomorrow morning. I think California time, it's supposed to be at 7.30 in the morning, if I That's remember time. correctly. So um, tune into LIGO or whatever your favorite uh, science channel is. Some of what I've told you about what they found might just be unfounded rumor based on what all these uh, you know, emails are, seem to be saying. But uh, according to people who, who, who have been uh, putting their life into this for a long time, I think this is pretty much the kind of scenario we're going to be seeing. They didn't see a supernova explosion giving off gravitational waves. It looks like they did see this pattern of gravitational waves, which matches perfectly with what you should see in a black hole merger. And again, they saw it at every LIGO detector on Earth simultaneously, which would mean it looks like it was the real thing. All right. I All think right. that's a good place to stop. Paul, thank you so much. Enlightening as well. All right. So my name's Joe. Thank you, Paul. Woo! -hoo! We actually have a live audience now. <laughs> If you're in Santa Cruz and you want to watch Paul live, we're going to be doing this every Wednesday, every Wednesday, every yeah. Wednesday 3 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Awesome. And if you're a Cabrillo student, come on down. We're going to be doing it in oh, room, yes. uh, what is this, 804. So tune in next Wednesday, 3 o'clock, and uh, we'll figure out something else awesome to talk about. All right, that is it. Those are my students. Say hi to everybody in the world. Hi, hi. Everybody in the world, That's right. <laughs> All right, that's it for today. See you next week.